Ken Blanchard is a graduate of Cornell University. Uh, he is the author of, or co-author of over three dozen books, including the well-known and highly read One Minute Manager, which uh, has been translated into 20, 37 languages and over 13 million copies sold. You have a bio sheet in your program. I'm going to try not to replicate any of that information. I want to tell you a little bit about Ken otherwise. Uh, he and his wife, um, Margie, were the founders of Ken Blanchard Companies back in 1979, Doctors Ken and Marjorie Blanchard. In 2010, 2011, and 2012, the Ken Blanchard Companies were awarded by TrainingIndustry.com a top 20 training company designation worldwide. It's quite impressive in my opinion. In 2007, the Coles Corporation recognized the Ken Blanchard Companies as their Human Resources Partner of the Year. Um, many of you know of Coles and have shopped there, as have I. Not often. My wife is looking at me like, when was that? Uh, but it, <laughs> I've been there once. Uh, once. In 2005, this perhaps is one of the most impressive things that I have recently learned about Ken. In 2005, Amazon.com recognized Ken Blanchard as one of their top 25 best-selling authors of all time. Yeah, I think so. Ken and Drs. Ken and Margie Blanchard were co-recipients of the Entrepreneur of the Year Award at Cornell University, their alma mater. And finally, um, Ken Blanchard was uh, inducted into the Human Resource Development Hall of Fame and received the Golden Gavel Award from Toastmasters International. I could go on, I won't. I, I would like to end his introduction by reading a quote if you are on our mailing list, our hard mail list, as well as our email list, you received this recently. I won't ask for a show of hands of those who read it. But I want to read from this uh, statement from our current chair, Hal Rice of Chick-fil-A. This sort of says it all about Ken Blanchard being here today, in my opinion. Hal Rice said, uh, he remembers that moment like it was yesterday. Ten years ago, Hal simply accepted the invitation from a friend to attend an event hosted by Needle's Eye featuring renowned author Ken Blanchard. He recalls it was that one small decision that significantly changed his life. Quote, when you look at what happened from that event, it's unbelievable, Hal said. A major part of my spiritual growth and development as a leader began at the Ken Blanchard event. This was in 2002. Having been in business for only a few years, at that point, how desired a place to connect with Christian business leaders, and he found that in Needle's Eye, currently our chair. Ken, you have a lot of people in this city who care for and love you and are very appreciative of having you today. Help me welcome our speaker, Dr. Ken Blanchard. What a joy to be here. Uh, 10 years, my God, time flies. Margie and I just were up at uh, her 50th college reunion. She claims she graduated from college when she was 10, uh, so <laughs> time does fly. Uh, why don't you all stand up? I'm gonna have you do something that sets the stage for what I wanna do with you today. <clears throat> I'm gonna ask you to do two things, and when I'm through with a thing, I'm gonna put my hand up. When you see my hand up, then put yours and be quiet, so. The first thing I want you to do is just wander around as best you can uh, where you are for about 30 seconds and greet as many people as you possibly can, but greet them in a very special way. Greet them as if they're unimportant and you're looking for somebody much more important to talk to. <laughs> <coughs> so if you could do that, please. <coughs> 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 Okay, all right, put your hand up if you see my hand, quiet, Shh. 
okay? <clears throat> All right, now, wander around again for about 30 seconds. This time, greet people as if they're a long lost friend and you are really glad to see them. <clears throat> Okay, you can sit down. <coughs> All right. Now, uh, why did I do that except I'm from California? Uh, we're going to bring in some hot tubs in a little while. Uh, but uh, I am so convinced if you want to have a great family, a great church, a great business, you have to know how to manage people's energy, including your own. Now, where was there more energy in the room, the first activity or the second activity? Second, significant. And what did I do to change the energy in the room? All I changed was what you were thinking. From a negative thought, these are unimportant people, to these are long lost friends. And the whole energy changed. And it's really interesting. How many of you know that the brain and the computer have a lot in common? What they have in common is that the brain and the computer doesn't know the difference between the truth and what you tell it. You put information in a computer, it doesn't say, where'd you get that information? You know, those facts are wrong. The computer does whatever it can with the information you give it. We've said for years with the computer, what? Garbage in what? Garbage out. The same way with the brain. The brain doesn't know the difference between the truth and what you tell it. If you woke up this morning and looked in the mirror and said, you are fabulous, your brain is going to say, who are you kidding? I, I know you're a lot better than that. No, the brain really is so important. And it's what you put in it, your beliefs. In the Bible it says, as a man believeth, believeth a man becomes. And it's so interesting about the power of your beliefs. We have a wonderful Jewish friend who's... Oh, elder, you know, adult son is, is dying of cancer. We were with her recently, and she was just feeling so down about that. And I said to her, what's your belief about life after death? And she said, when life is over, it's over. I said, well, I don't believe that. I think that after life is unbelievable. She said, how do you know that? I said, I don't know it. I just believe it. And I like my belief a lot better than yours. <laughs> I mean, why would you choose a lousy belief? <laughs> and uh, so this morning really is about two things, is really what are your beliefs, and then how do those beliefs impact your behavior? A friend of mine, Hiram Smith, has a wonderful concept called the belief window. He said, we all have beliefs in our window that we look out into the world, and those beliefs drive our behavior and that behavior either gets us results that are positive or results that are negative. And he said, any time that something's not working for you in your life, it can be traced to a lousy belief in your window. So he had a friend who's working on his fourth marriage. And uh, he said, you know, what's your belief about, you know, women in marriage? Well, the man is in charge, you know, and all this. And he said... How's that been working uh, for you? It's, uh, uh, the, you know, might be something you want to visit. Uh, so, uh, so beliefs really are important. And what do you believe about the Lord? What do you believe about that? And then how does that start to drive your behavior? Because we don't just want to talk about beliefs alone. I mean, one of the powerful things about Needle Eye is they're not only interested in sharing the gospel and sharing about the Lord, but they're interested in how do you take that into your life as a parent, as a friend, as a, as a leader. I mean, a lot of people think that, you know, if they go to church, they're a Christian. I mean, going to church and calling yourself a Christian makes about as much sense as saying that you're an automobile when you're in your garage. Uh, you know, you got to start to do something. And so I want to talk about that 
uh, part of it too. But first, let me just talk about beliefs and how I got to where I am and why I think Jesus is the greatest leadership role model. Because I was not a believer uh, in Jesus for a long time. Uh, it's so interesting, I was actually uh, named after a Presbyterian minister. My mother and father were great fans of a pastor by the name of Bob Hartley. And my middle name is Hartley. And uh, he died when I was five years old, so I never really got to know him much. And, but I went to Sunday school with the other kids and all, but they didn't tell us too much about Jesus. And, and in junior high school, I uh, split and went to the Methodist church because they had a better basketball team. And, uh, <laughs> and then after I got out of high school, I went to Cornell. And Cornell was one of the first of those universities called in, no, in loco parentis. I mean, they're not going to be your parent. And they could have cared less about our spiritual growth. And so I, I even drifted away even more. And, and then when Margie and I got married right after uh, she graduated, uh, she said, we ought to get involved in a church. And we did. We even helped in the junior high school program. But then we, our first teaching job, we went to Athens, Ohio in 1966, right in the middle of the Vietnam War. And the pastor we just loved in town was leading all the student sit-ins against the war. And his congregation fired him in the most vicious thing we had ever seen. And we said, if that's what Christianity is all about, you can have it. You know, we were idealists. And our kids were two and three at the time. And <clears throat> at 18 years old, if you said to them, give me the Lord's Prayer or I'm going to hurt you, you'd have to hurt them. They couldn't even give you that. And so I didn't think too much about the Lord until the One Minute Manager came out in 1982, and it was so ridiculously successful, I was having trouble taking credit for it. And so people started saying, Ken, why do you think the One Management Manager is so popular? And I started saying, for some reason, I don't know, God must be involved. And my mother was always praying for me. And the minute I said, you know, God might be involved, it's amazing how the good Lord starts sending you people. And I get a call, but I write a book with Norman Vincent Peale. And I said, is he still alive? Uh, <clears throat> I mean, my parents went to his church before I was born. And Norman was 86 years old at the time. And uh, we were asked to write a book together called The Power of Ethical Management. And it was amazing how Norman and Ruth took Margie and I under their wings. And they didn't beat on us or anything. They, they just said, the Lord's always had you on his team. You just haven't suited up yet. And so suiting up became kind of the, the, the cry. And uh, then the Lord started to send other people into my life. I was heading down to <coughs> Mexico City to a big gathering of, of the Young Presidents Organization, YPO. We were resources for them. And, and uh, we flew from San Diego to Dallas and then Dallas to Mexico City. And the Lord put Bob Buford across the aisle from me on the plane. And some of you probably know Bob. He wrote Halftime. And Peter Drucker said he's probably one of the five most influential Christians in, a, in America today, basically working with business uh, folks and churches and helping. He's the one that really created a whole organization to train people like Rick Warren and Bill Hybels and all these young pastors that created mega mega churches, and so <clears throat> I'm sitting chatting with, with Buford, and I went into my wallet to, to get a card to give him, and amongst the dollar bills was this little booklet that Bill Bright, who headed up Campus Crusade wrote, called The Four Spiritual Laws, and my good friend Phil Hodges had given it to me. His daughter got it in junior high, and I don't ever remember putting it in my wallet. I mean, it wasn't something that I would have put in my wallet, but there it was. And I said, Bob, it's here for a reason. Do you mind if I ask you some questions? And he said, no, not at all. But he said, I'm not a pastor, but I'll do the best I can. The, the first law was God has a plan for your life, Jeremiah 29, 11, you know, and I, I could buy that. But the second one was the one that I didn't like at all. It said we were sinners. And I didn't like that for two reasons. Number one, I hate labels. I don't know if you've ever, you know, said to a friend you're a sinner, they just don't say thank you for the feedback, you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, so appreciate your sharing uh, and, uh, and all. And then uh, <clears throat> the thing that always got me was this concept of original sin. 
which is why do you have to start off bad? I mean, a baby in a crib, I mean, how could they be a, be a sinner? And so Bob in his kind of uh, low-key Texas way says, well, Ken, he said, uh, let me just ask you a question. Do you think you're as good as God? And I said, obviously uh, not if there's God, that's perfection. He said, okay, why don't we give God 100? He said, we'll give axe murderers five. And Mother Teresa was alive then. He said, she's a pretty good gal. Uh, why don't we give her 95? And Blanchard, you're not bad. You're trying to help people. I'll give you a 75 or an 80. He said, the neat thing about the Lord is he sent Jesus down to make up the difference between you and 100. And I went, wow, that's a really interesting way to talk about grace. Because if you say to somebody, where are you on a 1 to 100, they're not going to take you, say, 100. But if you tell them you're a senior, sinner, they're going to say, well, what about you? And they're defensive, but it's really interesting uh, to see so that we all fall short of uh, perfection. And, uh, and Bob said, well, Ken, let me tell you the whole story because some people don't like the whole deal. And I said, what's that? Is that, that the axe murderer has the same opportunity as Mother Teresa because it's not about deeds, it's about belief. Uh, and I went, wow, you know. And he said, well, let me turn you over to a friend of mine who's down here uh, at the conference too. He knows a little bit more about this than I. And he turned me over to Bill Hybels from Willow Creek. And if any of you know anything about Hybels, you get in his jaws and you're in trouble. <coughs> so I sat down and for lunch with Hybels and uh, Bill said, uh, I started to pull my little booklet out, you know, to ask the questions. He said, he said, wait a minute, Ken. He said, um, uh, let me just uh, tell you an interesting thing. He said, I want to tell you about the difference between religion and following Jesus. He said, it's how it's spelled. He said, religion is spelled do, D-O. This is whole to-do list of all these things you're supposed to do to get the Lord's grace. And... Most people in do religions quit because they never know when enough is enough. And then they change the rules and you can get kicked out. He said, following Jesus is spelled done. There's only one rule, do you believe? And you can't get kicked out because he already knows you can't be perfect. And that's why he's here, to, to be your partner. And I went, whoa. This is interesting. And he said, Blanchard, I don't know why you haven't signed up a lot sooner. Because <clears throat> he said, you get three consultants for the price of one. <laughs> you know, he said, you get the father who started it. He said, you get the son who lived it. And he said, the Holy Spirit is the day-to-day -day operational manager. And I thought, wow, that's really interesting. You know, the Holy Spirit always gets the kind of back end of everything. In fact, we don't even have a swear word for the Holy Spirit. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but, uh, but the Holy Spirit is what J Jesus left for us once we sign up and we believe. It's, a, it's your really day-to-day -day operational uh, manager. And so, uh, so the more I uh, thought, he said, you know, you can sign up uh, this weekend if you want. You know, I said, well, how do you sign up? He said, it's pretty easy for a one-minute manager. Uh, <laughs> he said, all you have to do is bow your head and say, Lord, I can't make it to 100 by myself. I accept Jesus as my Savior and as my bridge between me and you. And, and he said, that's really it. And I said, really? He said, yeah. And so well, I'm still kind of reluctant. Uh, Norman Vincent Peale had said to me, to Ken, that the toughest test of self-esteem is to bow your head and admit you can't do it by yourself. He said, people like Ted Turner who say Christianity is for sissies, said that's not true. So it's a tough test of self-esteem to get yourself out of the way and realize that you need help and you got a day-to-day -day operational manager to help you as well as the two other consultants. And so uh, Margie and I had started our company and uh, we had worked with a consultant, and we thought he knew a lot about business. We didn't know too much. And so we asked him to come in and be president of the company. And, and uh, he, uh, he knew a lot about business, but he was beating up our people, and he didn't have the same values and, and all. And so um, 
Margie and I were meeting for dinner to say, what were we going to do with this fella? And I'm driving up from San Diego, and I'm thinking so hard I'm getting a headache. And all of a sudden, I get this blinding flash to the obvious that why am I trying to figure this out by myself? I got this three-man consulting team. And I said, Lord, I can't bow my head completely because I'm driving. <laughs> <coughs> but I finally get it that I can't make it to 100 by myself and I accept Jesus as my Savior and my bridge between you and I. And I want to tell you, the energy that I suddenly felt within a couple of minutes come into me. I walked in the restaurant and Margie said, what happened to you? <laughs> and uh, I told her and, and uh, it was really amazing. The next day I went in to talk to this fellow who was our president and, and uh, about some of our concerns in the middle of the thing, he jumps up and he said, I quit, I am sick and tired of this kind of thing, you know. And boom, you know, uh, he started to pack up his stuff. Now, I said, well, <laughs> I'll see you. And I, <laughs> I walked out and uh, uh, I thought, my God, Lord, you really intervened quickly. Um, <laughs> but I realized later that the Lord didn't really sort of say, I'm going to take care of your president for you. But what you, happens when you sign up is you put on the armor. And I'm a pleaser, you know, and I want people to be happy. And my past pattern when he said, I quit, you know, I've had enough, I would have said, oh, no, Kelsey, let's talk, you know, and all that kind of thing. But with the armor on, I said, I'll see you. And that night he realized he had made a mistake and he called Margie and said he wanted to, wanted to talk to me. And I said, no, it's over. And I would have never done that uh, before. And uh, so it's been a really powerful journey. And uh, the, uh, then I had some amazing experiences that got me into Lead Like Jesus. I was on the Hour of Power with Bob Shula uh, in 1984. And uh, he wanted to talk to me about the one minute manager. And <clears throat> he said to me, Ken, he said, you know who the greatest one minute manager of all time was? And he said he really loved the book. And he, he said, Jesus. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, he was really clear on goals. Wasn't that your first secret, one minute goal setting? I said, yeah. And he said, you and Tom Peters didn't invent management by wandering around. <clears throat> Jesus did. By he wandered from one little village to another village. If anybody showed any interest, he'd heal them, he'd praise them. Isn't that your second secret? One minute praise them. Yeah. And he said, if people stepped out of line, he wasn't afraid to give them a one minute reprimand. You know, he threw the money lenders out of the temple and, and uh, redirected people when they were off. Isn't that your third secret? One minute, yeah. He said, well, he's the greatest one minute manager of all time. <clears throat> and so I said, wow, that's really interesting. So being a behavioral scientist, I went to Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. I wanted to see what the man did. And I just started to laugh. It just blew my mind. Because everything I had ever taught about leadership, everything I had ever written about leadership, Jesus did with these 12 incompetent guys that he hired. I mean, you wouldn't have hired that lot. Uh, and uh, uh, I was on a program with uh, John Ortberg. We were doing a Lead Like Jesus uh, teleconference out of Atlanta. And John was at Willow Creek, and now he's out at Menlo. Park Presbyterian, he's one of the great authors uh, uh, out there. And I said, John, why would you travel across the country to tell everybody that Jesus is the greatest leadership role model? Because a lot of people say, I mean, how can you say that? And, and uh, they wrote about it in the paper here. Some of you might have read. But John uh, said that, uh, he said to the audience, and we were teleconferencing around the country, he said, Suppose you were gamblers 2,100 years ago. I know some people don't like gambling, but let's just suppose, where would you have put your money on winning and lasting the Roman Empire and the Roman army or a little Jewish rabbi with 12 inexperienced followers? And he said, isn't it interesting, 2,100 years later, we name our kids Peter, Paul, you know, Jesus, Mary, and we name our dogs Nero and Caesar. <laughs> <coughs> <laughs> he, he, said, he said, I rest my case, you know. And uh, so uh, 
But as I, as I looked at the, uh, at the Gospels, it was just amazing what Jesus did with these 12 people and how he put his energy into them. And the important thing about leadership to me over the years is not what happens when you're there, it's what happens when you're that, not there. Because it's easy to get people to do what you want when you're hovering all over. As a parent, <coughs> your parenting effectiveness is determined when you're not around, not when you're there. Uh, and so Jesus uh, is still impacting people, you know, 2,100 uh, years later. And uh, so uh, I realized he was the greatest leadership role model of all times, and yet nobody was teaching it in the divinity schools. Nobody was teaching it in the churches. And so I thought, I guess this is what the Lord wants me to do now that I'm on, a, on your team. It's really interesting that even if you haven't signed up yet, once you finally sign up, and you look back in your life, you can see God's hand in your life backwards a lot easier than anything. And so I see all of the, the things that the Lord gave me, you know, including, you know, we developed situational leadership back in the late 60s, and that's used worldwide today more than any leadership theory in the, in the world. And, and Jesus was a classic situational leader, which is you change your leadership style as the development level of your group and individuals gets better. So you start off in the beginning with a directing leadership style <clears throat> with enthusiastic beginners. And when Jesus hired his first disciples, what did he say to them? He said, come with me and I will make you fishers of men. Do they know anything about that? No, they bopped off down the beach, you know, follow them. They were enthusiastic beginners. So what did he do in the first commission? It's about two pages of directive behavior. Told them where to stay, what to wear, what to do, and all. And then you start to see his style change from directing to coaching to supporting to delegating as they develop over time. And, and at the end of Matthew, what does he do? Is he delegates. It's very different, that commission, than the first one. What did he say? He said, go and make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You know, and boom, you know, that was, the, that was the direction. But what he said next was so important. But remember, I will be with you till the end of the age because Jesus is waiting uh, here to be on your side. I, I wrote a book with Wally Armstrong, one of the great golf teachers, called The Mulligan about golf and faith. And if any of you know anything about golf, that a mulligan is on the first tee uh, if you hit a lousy drive uh, and you have nice people playing with you, they'll say, why don't you take a mulligan, which is another, another shot. Well, Jesus is the greatest mulligan of all time because he's given us mulligans all the time, given us a second shot. And, uh, and in that book, it's kind of a story of a, uh, kind of an uptight businessman who's uh, late for a pro-am in Asheville, North Carolina. And He's a little upset with himself because he had flown down from Atlanta the night before to the, the pairing party. And they drew Davis Love the third as their pro-am partner. And he gets there late, doesn't have any time to hit any balls. And he's an 11 handicap. And he's hoping that Davis is going to really enjoy playing with him. And he seemingly graciously asks the other three people to hit off. And they're all terrible. They're 20 or above handicap. And he's smiling. And, but he gets up to the first hook and he duck hooks it in the rough and chops it out. And he's just playing awfully. And finally, on the ninth hole, he hits an incredible drive, knocks a four iron up about four or five feet from the cup. And Davis Love is down on his knees looking at the putt because if he knocks it in, it's an eagle, two under par for their team. And he gets up and putts it and leaves it short and takes his putter and breaks it right over his knee. And everybody just kind of scatters. and. As he's walking to the 10th by himself, he's thinking, I just ought to head straight to the car. This is awful. And Davis Love is waiting for him. And uh, I knew Davis's dad, Davis Love Jr., fabulous guy, before he was, he was killed. And, and Davis says to this guy, and this is a line actually Davis has used in a program, and he said to him, you know, we haven't had a chance to talk too much the first nine, but I've been watching you. And to be honest with you, you're not that good to get that mad. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> and he, he said, uh, 
if my dad was still alive, he said, I'd have you go to see him because he could straighten out your golf and your life, but he's not. But there's an old friend of his that sits up on the, on the front porch of the clubhouse, and usually in a rocker, and he's almost 90 years old, but he's amazingly sharp. We call him the old pro. Go see him after the round, and he'll straighten out your game and your life. And so he goes to meet the, the old pro, and the way I wrote it was he's kind of a cross between George Burns and Oh God, and Clarence the Angel that saves Jimmy Stewart and It's a Wonderful Life. And so he starts working with this guy and one day he flies down for Atlanta to see the old pro and the old pro's in the golf car. He says, come on, we're gonna go play. He said, we're gonna play a special round today though. He said, I drive, you play and you can take a mulligan on any shot you want. He said, what do you mean? I thought it was just for the drive. No, he says, today you can take it. You can take a putt over, you can take everything. He said, well, I'm gonna enjoy this. And so interesting, in the beginning of the round, uh, he uh, takes a lot of mulligans, but halfway through, he hardly takes any. And he ends up shooting a 74, and he never broke 80 in his life. And so they're sitting at the 18th hole, and the old pro says, why did you think you played so well? And he said, well, he said, I think I realized after a while, if I made a mistake, I would be forgiven. And it made me relax. And he said, well, how, how would you like to be forgiven every day? He said, that would be great. What do I have to do? He says, not about doing, it's about believing. He said, you know him? He said, Jesus. He said, don't get religious with me. He said, no. He said, I'm not. But God knew, knew that everybody knew to, needed help, including Ben Hogan. He said, what does Ben Hogan have to do with it? He said, well, after Ben died, his wife Valerie in the Dallas paper said that Ben had this vision that you could play the perfect golf round you could birdie all 18 holes, do 18 under par. And she said he had a recurring nightmare that he birdied the first 17 and he misses a four footer on the 18th. <laughs> and the old pro says, unfortunately, that's not good enough. And the guy says, what do you mean? That's not fair. He says, not my rules. He says, it's, uh, it's God's rules. But he said, he sent Jesus down to play the perfect round. He uh, filled in the card, 18 birdies. And all you have to do is attest his score and turn it in as your own. And when you do, he's waiting on the first tee as your caddy. Now, some people don't like to talk about Jesus as a caddy, but, you know, what does he say to the disciples at the end? He said, I, I no longer call you servant, I call you friend. You know, and that he really wants to be our friend. He wants to walk uh, with us. And uh, so it's not just about you know, believing and going to church, the real action is what do you do the rest of the week? Because it's not just a one day a deal. He really wants to get in your heart and make a difference in, in the world. And so, uh, as I realized he was the greatest leadership role model of all time and started to really study what he did, is what I realized is that the world is in desperate need of a, a different leadership role model. We've seen what self-serving leaders have done in every segment of society, whether you're talking about business, religion, you know, government, whatever, around the world, uh, where leaders think that leadership is all about them and they want all the power and the money and the recognition and everything to go up the hierarchy and everybody else uh, uh, be damned. <coughs> and uh, so we really need servant leaders. And what we found is that uh, Bill Hybels was teaching situational leadership to everybody at Willow Creek. And I said, why are you doing that? He said, well, that's what Jesus did. And so he was reaffirming what Shula had uh, found about Jesus being the greatest one minute manager. Now, Heibel's saying he's teaching situational leadership uh, <coughs> to everybody at Willow Creek. And, uh, and so I said, well, that's really something. Why don't we write a, a book together on uh, leadership by the book, which is what we did. And I asked Phil Hodges, who is a long-term friend of mine and played a major role in my conversion and helped me start uh, Lead Like Jesus. And uh, so we were sitting at, uh, Bill's a great sailor and they spend the 
summer in, uh, in, uh, on Lake Michigan. And uh, Bill said to me, Ken, what's your biggest disappointment in your work? And I said that more people don't use it. Uh, people come up to me all the time, oh, God, I just love your books, you know, and I just read them all, you know. <laughs> and uh, I try to be nice, but I like to say, did you ever use any of it? Uh, <clears throat> you know, because uh, it's so interesting, you know, I'll ask people around the world, you know, how do you know whether you're doing a good job? You know what the number one response I get? Nobody's yelled at me lately. No news is good news, you know, and... and uh, of all the things I've probably taught over the years, I think the key to great, having a great family, great organization, great school and all, is to wander around, see if you can catch people doing something right and accent the positive. But most people don't get caught that. The, the number one leadership style around the world is what we call seagull management. You know, the manager tells you to do something, then they disappear, and you don't ever hear from them until you make a mistake, and then they fly in make a lot of noise, dump on everybody, and then fly out. <coughs> and uh, so uh, I knew <coughs> they're not practicing uh, what I preach and because and, uh, it, uh, it really makes quite a, quite a difference if you do. And so Bill said, I think your problem is, Ken, is you're like me. You were, have been trying to change people from the outside. He said, you know, I used to teach teach the Golden Rule and the Ten Commandments, until I realized that what Jesus was all about was giving us a heart attack. He wanted to get right in your heart. He, he didn't want you to be honest. He wanted you to be an honest person. He didn't want you to be loving. He wanted you to be a loving person. He wanted to change you from the inside out. And so I had never thought about teaching leadership beginning with the heart, and that's where we really do it. Those of you that come to uh, the leadership encounter either tomorrow or on the 23rd of, uh, of the month, that's a special day because that's Margie's and my 50th anniversary uh, on the 23rd of June. <clears throat> But if you come, the first thing you're going to realize is the first aspect of leading like Jesus is a heart question, which is the heart question is, why are you leading? Are you there to serve or be served? And that's the question that, that Jesus asked. I mean, when uh, Jesus uh, washed the feet of the disciples, what was he saying to them? He said, you know, just as I have done for you, do for others. He was really saying that we're here to serve. And when John and James brought their mother to see him, you know, good Jewish mother to convince Jesus, you know, because she wanted to know if one of her sons could sit in his right hand and one in his right, left hand in heaven. And after Jesus said that it wasn't uh, for him to grant, then he went over and sat with the disciples. Uh, and pretty powerful little speech where he said, you know, the Gentiles lord power over people. They use authority. Not so with you. And he essentially said, if you want to be first, you need to be last. If you want to lead, you need to follow. Even I have come to serve, not to be served. And so his mandate to us is to be servant leaders. But that starts in your heart with a heart question. Is, is, is that who you are in the core? Because if your core is self-serving, uh, it's going to be a little hard for you to eventually hide that core, uh, no matter how hard you, you try. So one of the things that we really look at initially is, who are you? And we want to have you take a look at what your mission statement is, you know, what's your picture of the future, what are your values uh, and all, and what's your leadership point of view? Because leadership starts inside. And uh, the thing that keeps us, you know, and we all are self-serving to an extent. Isn't that right? I don't care how perfect you are. Some days you get up and you want it to be your way and all. What's really neat is once you find out about this, you can catch yourself in midstream and laugh. Like I was on a plane a while back, American Airlines. I got like, you know, six million miles with them and I'm going through their magazine, and there's a picture of my sons 
and his wife's book and a great write-up. And my first response was, I've never been in American Airlines. I mean, what's my PR person doing, you know? And, uh, and then I caught myself and just laughed, you know? I mean, that's just such ego, you know, self-serving stuff rather than saying, wow, isn't that great? Look what's happened for Scott and Madge uh, and all. So uh, we all are self-serving to an extent, but it's our ego that bites us. Uh, and we, in that program, you'll participate in an Egos Anonymous meeting because uh, it's the biggest addiction in the world because there's two ways that our ego bites us. One is false pride uh, when you think you're better than other people and you're pushing and shoving for credit. And then uh, the other is fear or self-doubt when you think you're less than in both cases you're edging God out and you're focusing on yourself rather than realizing the way to overcome false pride is humility. People with humility don't think less of themselves. They just think about themselves less. And the way you overcome fear and self-doubt is to trust the unconditional love of the Lord. Uh, and so we start with the heart. And then we move to the head. What are your beliefs about leadership? And it's so interesting when I'm out there with business people and I start talking to them about servant leadership, they think I'm initially talking about the inmates running the prison or trying to please everybody or you know, some kind of religious movement. No, they don't understand. See, there's two parts of servant leadership. The first one is vision and direction. It's strategic leadership, which is about where are we going. This is the leadership part of servant leadership. Because if you don't have anything to serve, the only thing to get to serve is yourself. And so you really need a vision. I've done a little piece I'm putting on our blog about the one minute manager goes to Washington. Why are things so goofed up in Washington? Because we don't have a vision for this country anymore. We don't know what business we're in. We don't have a sense if we do a good job, what will happen. We don't have any operating values anymore. The values in this country is a squeaky wheel. Whoever protests and marches, then all of a sudden we pay attention to them rather than saying that's really interesting, that happens to be inconsistent with our values. And so you need a vision. All the great companies, I wrote a book with Colleen Barrett, who stepped down as president of Southwest Airlines, uh, called Lead with Love. And it's so interesting that the airline industry has lost money in its history. Southwest has made money every single year for 40 years. Why? Because you can ask anybody in South Airlines, what business are we in? You know what they'll say? We're in the customer service business. We happen to fly airplanes. What's the picture of the future? If you do a good job, what will happen? They, they will tell you, we want to democratize the airways. They believe that every American should be able to be with a friend or a loved one in a happy time and a sad time. That's why they're low cost airlines. And then they have <coughs> four values that everybody knows. Their number one value is safety because of the industry they're in. But then they have three values they want everybody to engage in every day. One is a warrior spirit, which is not combative. But if you have a job, do it. That's why they can turn a plane around in 10 or 12 minutes, because the pilots are in there dealing with the garbage with everybody else. They don't say, that's not my job. Let's get it done. We don't make any money unless we're in the air. Their second uh, value uh, that they want them to engage in every day is a servant's heart. I've never seen anybody else with that is the value, a servant's heart. And just recently, you know, of course, you probably know they bought AirTran, but they're not calling AirTran Southwest for 18 months to two years until they make sure they're part of their culture. I'm going down soon with, to work with Colleen and the Culture Committee, which is a group of people from every department of the company to keep on, they meet on a, almost a weekly basis. Are we being consistent with our culture and our values? And all, and, a, and a, an experienced pilot from, I think it was Delta, flew down to interview because they do need some extra pilots now. And uh, the word got to headquarters that he was rude to the staff on the plane. And when he got to corporate headquarters, he kind of blew off the receptionist. And she called upstairs and she said, there's a guy coming upstairs, I don't know why he's here, but let, let me tell you how he treated me. And I got word from the staff on the thing, how they treated him, they didn't even interview him. They said, maybe this will be helpful to you, but we're not putting pilots up that can't fly 
but we're not putting pilots up there who think it's all about them. And they didn't either because you have to have a servant's heart. And then the f final value they have is a fun-loving uh, attitude, which is a Herb Kelleher thing. You know, a friend of ours was flying Southwest recently, and the steward got on the plane on a microphone. He says, the last flight of the day, and we're really tired, and we don't have the energy to pass out the peanuts and the potato chips. So we're going to put them on the floor up front, and as we take off and gain altitude, <laughs> <coughs> They'll come down the aisle and you can get your peanuts. And she said it was just a hoot, you know. And uh, uh, a passenger wrote to Colleen one time and said, you know, I think it's wrong that your people fool around during the safety announcements, you know. I think you should deal with them and stop that kind of behavior. And most presidents would write back and say, you know, I appreciate your, your, your letter and hope you continue to fly with us. Here's a couple of coupons. And, Colleen wrote back and said, we'll miss you. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> you know, if you don't, uh, you know, have the values, then uh, uh, we don't really care. And so that's the first thing is that vision and direction uh, piece. Then the second part is the implementation. And now what you got to do is turn the pyramid upside down. With vision, it's all, it's the responsibility of the leadership to get the vision. It doesn't mean you don't involve people. Jesus got his vision from his father. But then when he washed the feet of the disciples, he was going to the second part of servant leadership, which is implementation, which is the servant part. And that's where you got to turn the pyramid upside down because now you work for your people. They don't work for you. Your job is to do everything you can to help them win. And if you turn it upside down, they can, they can be eagles rather than ducks. You can always tell an organization where you have self-serving leaders because it's a customer if you deal with them, you got a problem, you got a duck that's quacking, quack, quack, it's our policy, quack, quack, I just work here, quack, quack, I didn't make the rules, quack, 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 you know, <laughs> and all because they're more impressed with, you know, impressing their supervisor than you, where if you get eagles, you know, and you've turned the pyramid upside down, they'll take care of it, it'll be done, my favorite, Southwest story is uh, I was, uh, when I fly, I have this thing I hang around my neck. I call it my geezer pouch. You know, you get older, you forget things. But in my geezer pouch, I have my ticket, my passport, my license, you know, my itinerary, pen and pencil, and I go around the airport, you know, what do you <laughs> need? I got my geezer pouch. And, and uh, so one day I loaded that beauty up and I left it uh, in, uh, in my office at home, and I'm pulling into the airport in San Diego. I got no official identification. It's only two or three years after 9-11, so they're a little uptight, and I hadn't started working uh, with Colleen or anybody there. But uh, So the only book I've ever written, I got my picture in the cover, is the one I did with Don Shula, the Miami Dolphins coach, called Everyone's a Coach, and they took our picture in Miami Stadium. So I ran into the bookstore, and they happened to have a copy, and I bought it. And, and the, the first airline I went to was Southwest. And the guy's checking my bag, and he said, could I see your identification? I said, I feel badly. I don't have a license or passport. How's this? And I held the book up. The guy looks out, and he shouts out, this man knows Don Shula. <laughs> said, put him in first class. Of course, they don't have first class. And they're high-fiving me out there. Hey, the guy knows Shula. You know? And there was an older guy there who said, I know the security guard's upstairs, and I think I can get you through. Uh, which he did. And why is that? Because at Southwest, they turn the pyramid upside down and they empower their people to use their brains. Didn't think I had superimposed my picture on this cover to get by them. And the bigger deal is whether I have any weapons. Now, the next airline I had to go to before they had time to overnight my license was one of the biggies. And uh, when I showed the book, Meg, the duck doo doo started to fly, you know. <laughs> You know, quack, you better talk to the ticket counter. I showed it to the quack, you better talk to the supervisor. And we call the supervisory duck the head mallard, you know, because <laughs> they just quack at a higher level. Have you ever seen them, you know? And so pretty soon, I'm about five levels up talking to a guy in a suit and a tie. And I started to give him a hard time, and I realized he was a real bureaucrat, so I had to change my style. And I said to him, what a difficult job you must have, you know? <laughs> I just appreciate your considering my thing, you know, and, uh, and he finally let me in. Uh, so, uh, but you had to suck up the hierarchy to, to do it. And so 
that's really the whole uh, heart thing which leads into the hands, which is what does it mean behaviorally uh, to it. And uh, so um, the final thing that we, we get at that you'll really end the workshop and it's worth the whole thing is what are the habits that Jesus used to keep himself on the straight and narrow? Because remember, he was both God and human. He was tempted like we are. And what do you use? Solitude and prayer and the study of scripture. Uh, he also had a small group that he could be more intimate with. Do you have a small truth-telling group that you can be more intimate with? He had John and James and Peter. And then finally, the last habit is to trust the unconditional love of the Lord. And that's a really powerful, powerful uh, thing. And uh, so uh, leading like Jesus is about living like Jesus. It's about taking your beliefs and bringing them into your life in a way that's going to make him smile. Uh, because you really are living. I, and that's what we need to do. We find around the country, country and the world, people love Jesus. They don't necessarily like Christians. Because you know, I think there's still too many Pharisees in our faith that are running around judging every people, where Jesus said, you'll be known as my disciples by how you love each other. Uh, and uh, servant leadership is love in action. And so come to one of those. And I want to just introduce some folks here. First, uh, Bobby Ucrop's on our National Lead Like Jesus board and was instrumental in bringing Lead Like Jesus here for the first time. And, uh, and, and Harold Babs uh, on our executive board for Lead Like Jesus and being a tremendous uh, asset uh, for us as we go forward. We're now in 40 nations. We have 30 Lead Like Jesus trainers in India. We trained 2,000 people in Uganda uh, last October, and a bunch of them have gone to Kenya, and it's just amazing <coughs> where the Lord is taking this. And then Phyllis Henry here is uh, from Augusta, Georgia, and she heads up our ministry. Our training companies in California, I didn't want anybody to think I was trying to make money off of Jesus. And the South is much more, and then I found Phyllis, and she's the greatest leader, so it's, it's housed, uh, housed there. And so uh, uh, I am just uh, so excited. You know, when I turned 65, I was talking to Zig Ziglar on the phone. You know, some of you probably heard of Zig, and, and he had invited Margie and I to the 59th anniversary of his 21st birthday. And... Uh, <laughs> And I said, Zig, are you going to retire? He said, there's no mention of it in the Bible. He said, except for Jesus, Mary, and David, and a couple of other people, nobody under 80 made an impact. He said, I'm refiring, not retiring, which is such a great concept. And so I'm refired, and my refiring is our mission in Lead Like Jesus is 7 billion people's lives impacted on a daily basis by people leading like Jesus. So we want to get that word because we think that the greatest way to really evangelize in the future is demonstration more than proclamation. And if you start to behave differently in your organizations and your families and all, and people watch you, and then they're gonna say, where does all this come from? And then you can really tell them about the Lord. But. Uh, just remember, you got just the most tremendous friend in Jesus. And when you get that belief in your head and he puts the Holy Spirit in your heart, then you can really make a difference in the world. Wow, what an exciting thing. So God bless you all. It's just been great uh, to be with you. Incredible message, I think, even more exciting than 10 years ago, and that was incredible. Uh, and as I, as I finally reflect, or reflect uh, finally on our comments that we've heard today, um, I am absolutely reminded, and was throughout Ken's remarks, 
of one of the statements that he made at the beginning of uh, his talk. And that statement was, and I know many of you have thought about it for the last 45 minutes, because if I were here today, and I wasn't really sure perhaps why I'm here, except I came with a friend who really cares about me. And as this wonderful speaker and, and, and brilliant and kind gentleman begins to talk about his own life, and I'm thinking, gosh, this is interesting. This is incredible. I um, haven't really thought about this before. I would think there would be a number of you here when he said, when he asked the question sort of to himself, how do I sign up? Remember that? Right at the beginning of his comments. I would imagine many of you have, over the last 40 minutes or so, at least a couple times said, this is really different. I've never, I've never really encountered this before when I've thought about, quote, religion. The idea of not doing, but being done. The idea of it's not about doing, but it's about believing. Um, how do I sign up? Well, I want to give you an opportunity to think through that just a little bit further. When we come back to the card in a moment, uh, there are some, some options there that I want to talk with you about. But before we do that, I want to have a closing prayer, a little bit odd, a closing prayer prior to when we actually close. I want to thank you for being with us in that prayer. I want to thank God for having Ken here, and I want to, th uh, want to uh, thank him for being present, him with a capital H. And then I'm going to stop in that prayer. It will be silent for just a moment. Don't be uncomfortable with that. And if during that time you have been asking that question and you'd like to sign up, just very quietly between you and God in your heart, Tell him that you can't make it by yourself. You can't get to 100%. You're not able to do that. Uh, that you're really sorry for what you have done, that you know has displeased him. You trust his son, Jesus Christ, as your new savior, and ask him to come into your life. In your words, just between you and God, that's how you sign up. So in that quiet moment, if you've been asking that question, or even right now for the first time you are, please make that opportunity personal to yourself. Say that prayer just quietly in your heart. And then we'll finish. I'll bring you back to the card, and we'll be complete for the day. Would you bow with me, please? <clears throat> Father, um, you have told us where two or more gathered in your name that you'd be in the midst. It is so obvious that you're here today. I thank you so much for everyone who is here, for all of those who offered invitations, who hosted tables, who made phone calls, because they have friends and colleagues and family members that they love and care about. And I thank you for them. I thank you for Ken and for his heart for you, his quick and capable mind, and the way that you have used him for decades as a wonderful emissary, not only for leadership, but for the one who lived how to do it. And now, Lord, uh, in the quietness of this moment, for those who would like to sign up with you, by your spirit, who is present so obviously in this room. Lead them to do that just between you and them right now. Lord, um, for all who have moved toward you this day, hold them closely in the palm of your hand. Grow them in their walk and relationship with you and meet their needs as you have promised. In a moment, take us safely to where we need to be next. 
And we thank you for this morning. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.